All right, another key concept, what can we store? Let me talk about a couple of aspects of this. First of all, what should we store versus what can we store? I would suggest are two different things. There's a big uh, trend lately in the industry that, in case you're not aware of it, has been sort of in the direction of getting rid of as much card data as possible. And there's a good reason for that, which I'm going to touch on several times throughout this presentation. It is in your best interest to get card data out of your environment wherever possible and not worry about trying to secure it at all. Just get rid of it. And I'm going to talk about some good ways of doing that. If you are left with some business reasons where you need to have some card data, then these are the guidelines you need to keep in mind. What can you store? What can't you store? The stuff in green, you can. The stuff in blue, you can't, looking at this slide here. So the primary account number, the actual, you know, usually 16-digit number on the front of the card, yes, you can store it. Yes, it must be recrypt encrypted according to that requirement 3.4 there on the right side. Must be encrypted and we're stored, or rendered unreadable, I should say. Cardholder name, service code and expiration date, those are things that go along with the card number. If they are stored in conjunction with the PAN or the card number, they must also be protected, not necessarily according to requirement 3.4. They don't necessarily need encryption, but they have to be protected. You can store all those things, though. The stuff in blue, full magnetic stripe data, a full copy of what's on that magnetic stripe on the card may never be stored to disk after authorization, ever. Secondly, card validation codes, the three or four digit numbers on the, on the back of most cards, front for American Express, those may never be stored after authorization, really should never be stored at all. And the PIN number or the encrypted PIN block, uh, those are things that you just should never have hit the disk, ever. It causes big trouble and certainly can never be stored to disk after the initial authorization. Uh, so the only case where that should ever be stored temporarily is in a, you know, our line is down, we have to do a, a delayed authorization kind of a thing. But those cases are, are growing more and more rare these days. Let me just add one thing here, something that a lot of people don't understand. A lot of, I hear again and again and again that people have to have this data. We need to have stored card data. And sometimes they say we need to have even the, the sensitive authentication data. But um, first of all, you never need to have the sensitive authentication data. Hopefully you all know that by now, that it's only needed for initial authorization. Any bank or processor will tell you the same thing, that once you've done initial authorization, you don't need to resubmit that CVV or CVC code on subsequent transactions. They can leverage the first one. But even basic card data, like the card number and name, a lot of companies think they have to have that for things like chargebacks, recurring transactions. I'm going to challenge you to talk to your banks and processors. It is not, in many cases, necessary to have that, uh, contrary to what you might believe, because a lot of banks and processors have told me that they can work with you such that as long as you've sent them the data from the initial transaction, for subsequent transactions, you can send them some set of data such as your terminal ID, your merchant ID, the date and time of the transaction, uh, and like the last four digits or something like that, and they can correlate to the original authorization and use that for recurring transactions and chargebacks. Now, I'm covering this quickly because we're limited on time today, but please understand that there's a very important consideration around whether or not you really need to be storing card data, short term or long term. If you think you need to, I'm just suggesting that you revisit that with your acquiring bank or processor. You might be surprised what options are on the table there. So moving on. Why is PCI different? Why are we having this, this webinar? And I think why are so many people attending? Because what you're probably experiencing, as we're showing on this slide, is that PCI is very different from a lot of the other compliance mandates out there. And most significantly, as I mentioned earlier at the beginning, is that this is being enforced like nothing we've ever seen. We are seeing people actually getting hit with uh, breach investigations, fines and penalties, having uh, processing uh, authorization shut down temporarily or indefinitely, uh, lawsuits. We're seeing all of these consequences unfolding uh, as it's relating to PCI compliance and uh, breach events in a way that we've just not seen happening consistently in other areas. You name it, HIPAA, SOX, uh, you know, uh, any of the other uh, state breach notification laws, uh, any of those areas uh, are just not seeing the type of enforcement uh, that you see with PCI. So it's, uh, it's something that is just a business reality today. If you're in business and you're dealing with electronic payments, PCI is something you need to deal with. Now, hopefully today you're going to come away with some ideas of how you can drastically reduce the pain uh, and discomfort of dealing with PCI by doing it in a smarter way, but you will have to deal with it at some level. 
Now, what we like to talk about in the, when you think about the process of getting compliant uh, and uh, leveraging the benefit that comes with that is, is what we're showing with this visual, visual here. Now, the phases on the top are kind of our approach. It might be something a little different, but just to use this as a, as a framing here, we usually start recommend that you do some kind of high-level review first, which we're calling a discovery here. Then there's a preparation phase, which I'm going to describe in detail shortly. And then we do our remediation work, and then you'd actually validate your compliance, and then there's ongoing maintenance. It's only once you've actually validated your compliance, once you get to that point where you can say, yes, we are now fully compliant with the DSS, that's where this safe harbor concept really kicks in. And that's important because that's really why we're all doing this. We want to have some protection if there is a breach. You know, because if you guys haven't seen this, one of the things that we were talking about in our in our in one of our internal meetings earlier is we've been seeing a shift in the tone in the media lately. And there's a lot of, of articles that we're seeing basically along the lines of, you know, it's not so much a matter about implementing controls to avoid a breach these days. It's that the tone is more of you're going to have a breach sooner or later. It's just become the clear that if you're, if you're connected to the Internet and you're doing, you know, uh, all these different types of electronic uh, uh, interactions like uh, are part of today's business world, it's just something that is going to happen sooner or later. So the, the recommendations are more and more to set aside some of the uh, spending and budget for preparedness and actually preparing for what might be to some extent uh, inevitable over the longer uh, term. And so the idea here, the way that relates to PCI is, Understand that as you're working through this and as you're implementing controls and remediating, there's certainly a, a lowering of risk that's happening, as indicated by this downward line. You're reducing risk as you implement controls, as you develop your policies and processes. But if there was a breach that happened along the way and you can't show full compliance, there's still going to be very heavy consequences. Whereas if you get to the point where you can really show full compliance, there still could be a breach. It happens but you will have very strong protection in that case. And I'll talk about that again when we start talking about some of the state laws that are, that are coming out now and how that relates to that. Another view on that, just to take that a step further, is to think of it in terms of the 80-20 rule. As this visual indicates, it, it's kind of like you get 80% of the return on the last 20% of the work. Because again, you're doing all this remediation, it's lowering your risk, but it's that final being able to validate and show full compliance, that's what really you know, kicks in the safe harbor so it's, the idea here is we've, we've had, unfortunately, a number of organizations that have, have gotten started with PCI and had to kind of put it on hold for usually budget reasons and then ended up having some kind of a breach incident during that time and, uh, you know, end up finding that, of course, they're going to spend a lot more than on that breach than they would have spent to just get compliant. So we want to encourage you guys here to, if you are still in that mode where you're working on getting compliant, do it as quickly as you can, because really you're, you're sort of exposed uh, in a very real way until you are able to show full compliance. So section two, and the second and third sections are shorter um, than the first, but I know we are running short on time here, so I'm going to uh, keep the pace fairly, fairly quick here. Very high level on cost. I know a lot of you are asking, what is it going to cost to get compliant? This visual is giving a very broad stroke, as you can tell, and it's just indicating some of the stats we saw out of Gartner, combined with some of the stats that we see coming out of our own client base. And the only thing I'm trying to show here is that at a very high level, number one, the costs range extensively. Number two, the costs are going to vary greatly based upon the complexity level, which is driven by a number of things that we'll be talking about here. Your cost can be anywhere from close to zero. You know, some companies can do it for, you know, maybe a, a 10 grand, 20 grand if, you, if you're a smaller company that takes a very creative uh, approach and outsources a lot. Uh, up to, you know, uh, we've seen companies spend, uh, you know, a million dollars or more, but as far as uh, our clients, we've never seen people get anywhere near what Gartner claims the average to be. We like to think a lot of that is based on our approach, but um, a lot of that is de dealing with the size and complexity of the environment. Another view on this, just to give you some general range of costs, the Ponemon Institute, who does yearly studies of the cost of compliance and cost of data breaches, Unfortunately, their last study specific to PCI cost was in 09, so that's the latest we have. But they showed that cost to achieve PCI compliance is typically about a third of the overall IT security budget. So most of you, uh, you, you guys on the call might not all have a $15 million security budget, but it still works. If you have a million dollar security budget, well, maybe you're going to spend a few hundred grand on remediation. These are very broad stroke estimates, but it's, it's probably the best I can give you in terms of general estimations at the early end of this. 
But what he has to think about is, is how that compares to the alternative. What if we have a breach? The same organization, Ponemon, again, they do annual studies, and this is their 2010 study of the cost of a data breach. And what's interesting here is notice how much more expensive it is in the U.S. I'm sorry, actually, it looks like this is their 09 data. It was just the slides were from 2010. But the costs in the U.S. are significantly higher than the costs in other areas. Uh, so the average being $6.75 million is the average cost of a breach. Bottom line, getting compliant is going to be a lot less than the cost of a breach in most cases. That's the, that's the takeaway there. So let's talk about some strategies for cost-effective compliance. At a high level, number one, documentation is key. You've got to know what's going on in your environment. You've got to have good topology diagrams, and you've got to have good, clear documentation of your credit card data flows. How does credit card data move through your environment? Where does it sit? Who has access to it? That's all got to be documented clearly to lead into proper remediation planning. And of course, it will need to be updated as things change. Number two, Eliminate card data wherever you can before you go and start working on remediation and securing all that data. Number three, then work on reducing scope. We're going to talk about network segmentation and outsourcing. Both of means data tokenization, a form of outsourcing. End-to-end -end encryption, another very popular strategy that's coming up for outsourcing and improving uh, security and shifting some of the, uh, 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 the liability of PCI to third parties. Those are all ways of shifting some of the burden to third parties and reducing otherwise the scope of how PCI applies to your organization. Those are all part of what we recommend as some of the preparatory efforts leading into remediation planning. And then when you do remediation, we recommend that you use the prioritized approach, which the council makes freely available on their website and can provide a good framework for how to approach which requirements you should do first, which give the most bang for the buck in terms of security, and so on. A couple of screenshots just to indicate kind of some of the types of documentation we recommend having on hand. On the left side, you're seeing the type of sort of uh, binder that we typically organize for our clients. And as you can see, it covers a lot of ground. Overview information, scoping details, topology diagrams, card data flow docs, uh, total inventories of in-scope assets, uh, your policies and standards, your maintenance logs, also everything that relates to PCI all in one place, strongly recommended and it's going to make your validation cost less and go more smoothly, too. And then over here on the right, you're seeing a sample card data flow uh, documentation. There's different ways of doing that. That's an example of how we do it. But good, clear documentation of what's happening is going to make your lives a lot easier. Again, I've touched on this. The smart approach to PCI is not about securing sensitive data, but getting rid of it altogether. It's much better to eliminate data first and then turn your attention to what's left. You're going to save yourself a lot of money, and you're reducing risk at the same time. So here you have a quick overview of the HALOC process. And I'm not going to spend much time on this, because we already covered it at a high level. Basically, it's a four-phase approach that we recommend, starting with a high-level review, then going into a preparation phase that's all about how can we eliminate card data? How can we outsource? Can we use tokenization? Can we use end-to-end -end encryption? Can we use a managed hosting provider? Can we outsource our call center handling? There's all sorts of things that can be explored to help shift those burdens uh, you know, to some extent to third parties. Then you go into remediation, because now you know what the scope of that remediation is. Where do we have to remediate? And uh, that will, of course, help to keep costs down. Once that's done, we move on to remediation and ongoing maintenance. At a high level, that type of approach is what we recommend. And uh, of course, we'll be happy to talk through that in much more detail as a follow-up if any of you are interested. A couple of quick samples here on the network segmentation, if that wasn't clear there. Here we have a sample diagram, just typical environment. The servers highlighted in red down along the bottom indicate those systems that are, in this case, are handling credit card data directly, storing it, transmitting it, et cetera. So you have some application servers, some database servers, et cetera. Those are the ones touching card data. In this kind of an environment, the scope of PCI compliance would look something like this. In other words, everything would be in scope. Why? Remember that connected systems rule. All these various connected systems that are in those same segments automatically in scope. And even these satellite offices, because they're just connected by a point-to-point -point router, and in this case, we're saying that that does not have a firewall feature set on it for the techies on the line, that would be considered a flat network, and they are in scope. 